Welcome everybody to the Liturgy of the Chalice. We're about to discuss the Gospel of Philip, part four. We've been discussing this very special scripture for some weeks now, and we'll continue to break it down verse by verse over the next month or so. The Gospel of Philip was found at Nag Hammadi with uh, several codices of different texts that are often classified as Gnostic Gospels. The Gospel of Philip is very different from what a lot of people are used to from the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in which they depict Jesus's life as a certain series of events from birth in some cases until death and resurrection. The Gospel of Philip is quite different. The Gospel of Philip is good news in the sense that it's bringing us teachings that we can use to purify our soul. Although it does record some interesting quotes from Mar Yeshua, the Master Jesus, it does not talk about his life. It really does share a lot about sacraments and ways of purifying the mind and body so that one can transcend attachment to the body and to the world so that the attention that is released from material attachment is given and prioritized towards God. So we'll continue our discussion. And again, as we go through the Gospel of Philip, for those that may be attending for the first time or listening to the first time, uh, we aren't going verse by verse. We're choosing certain verses as we go along. You're very welcome to uh, purchase the Gospel of Philip and read the whole thing if any of these verses are interesting to you. So let's continue our discussion. <clears throat> so here, our next verse is called God the Dyer. God is a dyer. Just as the good dies, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dies become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal. And God dips those to be dipped in water. So this is a very interesting phrase. And I think there are many ways that each of these verses can be interpreted by different people. But I do think that this is can be interpreted on at least two levels. Uh, God is a dyer. So as we see in the picture here to the right, we see a person dying close. In other words, you're becoming imbued with some sort of color. And color is a vibrational frequency that we can see with our eyes. So God is a dyer in the sense that he can permeate us with certain vibrations or certain colors poetically. So just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors, for his dyes are immortal. So this vibration, this color, this frequency that we can become immersed in through prayer and meditation, this transforms us. It changes our appearance, uh, not only outwardly, because people look more peaceful and happy when they truly seek God, but internally. And also, there are different bodies. Paul called them the, som the Soma, soma Psychicon and the Soma Pneumaticon. Uh, the Soma Psychicon is the physical body in the mind. And the Soma Pneumaticon is the spiritual or heavenly body that Paul talked about in his epistles. And of course, in pre-Kabbalistic thought and Kabbalistic thought, they break down the body and the subtle spiritual bodies to a great extent. It's not just a physical body in the mind and a spiritual body, but the spiritual bodies have many tiers according to Kabbalistic thought and pre-Kabbalistic thought. So again, in short, many people may be aware that there's a physical body, uh, an astral body to keep it simple, and a causal body. The, the physical body, of course, is what we're familiar with. 
the astral body is our energy body and it also consists of our mind and emotions. It also consists of the various elements that make up the spiritual body, the spiritual elements of earth, air, fire, wind, ether. All of that is part of the astral body. And the causal body is kind of God's idea. He had an idea and that idea became you. So everything is the mind of God, hermetically speaking and Gnostically speaking. And when we roll back the word Abba and what it means, we, we see that God is an emanator rather than a, than a creator, but that's for a different day's discussion. But at any rate, God emanated forth all beings, including you and myself. And when God first emanated us, there was an idea of us or a causal body. And then that's kind of like the, the blueprint of a house. The astral body is kind of like all the pieces that go into making a house, maybe cement, wood, copper tubing, plumbing, all the parts needed to make a house could be likened to the astral body. And then finally, the, the astral body is what ultimately creates or condenses through lowering spiritual frequencies into a physical body. If we are to ascend to God, we have to go back the way we came. We have to purify the physical body and then the astral and other subtle bodies that we don't have time to speak about today. And finally, the causal body, which is the idea of God. We, have to, we came down a ladder to come into the world. We descended through causal, astral, down to the physical bodies. If we want union with God, we have to retrace our steps and climb the spiritual ladder. We have to purify our bodies and our minds, the soma psychicon, as Paul called it. And then we have to go up through a series of astral bodies and causal bodies, so to speak, until we retrace our steps back to merging as one with that which emanated us which would be in Gnostic terms, the invisible or the unknown father, the father of Jesus, as they would call it. But he's also the father of all of us, the father, mother of all, the Abba. So when we do spiritual practices, we become imbued with God's divine energy. And that energy can heal the physical body, but also it transforms the astral bodies. So. If you have the ability to see auras or bioenergetic fields, people that are particularly spiritual will have a golden aura and great saints will develop a whitish aura with tints of yellow and sometimes tints of violet. So God does literally dye our aura special colors and special spiritual colors are golden white and sometimes the white appears to have like a tinge of violet in it but most commonly most people on the spiritual path you'll see as a golden light or a whitish light and you can see it around the perimeter of their bodies but again whenever we immerse ourselves in god's practices the halakha of mar yeshua the teachings of jesus the spiritual vibrations of those practices and coming closer to god literally dyes our astral body to higher frequencies, higher colors. Again, gold, white, and white with a tinge of violet are particularly spiritual people, people that focus and prioritize their life around spiritual practices. As one of my great teachers said, not spiritual practices, spiritual life. In other words, she meant don't just practice spirituality here and there, but make your whole life about seeking God. And she said, she gave a formula for spiritual illumination, which was eight hours are for you. Eight hours are for sleep and eight hours are for God. She said, that's the breakdown of life of a saint. Eight hours for God. That's scriptural study, helping the vulnerable prayer, meditation, uh, eight hours for sleeping and eight hours for whatever you need to do in life, work, clean your house, take care of your kids, et cetera. That's the ideal. 
although it takes a lot of discipline to get that integrated in spiritual life. But again, I don't want to get too far off topic. Those who are really immersed in seeking God will be dyed by God. You could see it in their aura as a golden or a white light. And ultimately, when you keep on immersing yourself deeper and deeper into God, God dies become immortal. The dyes that God gives us, the vibrations, the spiritual vibrations that we're immersed in, ultimately make us immortal. very beautiful phrase and that's what this means it's one level of understanding of what this means god dips those to be dipped in water so this also refers to the sacrament of baptism when you are baptized by one who truly knows how to baptize you are immersed in god's spirit the ruach hakodesh and that permanently changes somebody's astral body and then to build upon that sacrament, to mature that sacrament, people have to do the, the halakha of Mar Yeshua. So ultimately, we become immersed deeper and deeper in God's vibration until we can no longer feel a separation between God and ourselves. We become one. And in that state, you experience divine gnosis, divine knowledge. And that knowledge isn't just worldly knowledge or just book knowledge, but it's knowing your oneness with God and all humanity. The next verse is called seeing. People cannot see anything that really is without becoming like it. It is not so with people in the world who see the sun without becoming the sun and see the sky and earth and everything else without becoming them. Rather, in the realm of truth, you have seen things there and have become those things. You have seen the spirit and have become spirit. You have seen Christ and have become Christ. You have seen the father and will become the father. Here in the world, you see everything, but do not see yourself. But there in that realm, you see yourself and you will become what you see. This is so powerful, and we could talk about this for days, and you could write volumes of books about these sentences in this particular passage of the Gospel of Philip. It's so profoundly beautiful, and we're only going to touch the very surface level today. People that really want to become illumined, really want to experience gnosis, should put this on their refrigerator and read it every day. Put it on your bathroom mirror and read it while you're brushing your teeth to remind you of the goal. So people cannot see anything that really is without becoming like it. We can associate this with life. Uh, there's so many things that we don't understand. And unless we've gone through it, we can't really understand it. So people that are often in healing professions, uh, psychologists and therapists of all sorts, the best kind of psychologist that heals different mental issues is one that has gone to that same issue and has healed themselves. It makes them empowered to be a support, to be a, a guide, a way shower for people that are suffering the same way. But we truly can't help somebody to go beyond a problem unless we've gone beyond that same problem. So this is one level of understanding this in the material sphere. If we want to understand racism that Black people feel, then we have to immerse ourselves in that world. We have to actually live with Black people, walk with Black people, have friends that are Black, and live with them and see the kind of treatment they get. It's disgusting. The same thing with Latinos. The same thing with Jews, the same thing with homosexuals. If you want to understand what people are going through, try and become a good friend and listen. Go to the grocery store with them, go to Starbucks with them and see how people look at them because they're different. Be an old person, be a sick person. You cannot understand a person unless you walk in their shoes. And a very basic way is just befriending people. 
befriend people that are different than you and realize that there's really no difference at all. It's just the one soul in different colored candy wrappers, as my spiritual master has said. So if we want to help people, we have to truly understand it. And I, I don't believe that we can really heal people of anything unless we have gone through it ourselves and understand that. So therapists should specialize in areas. Uh, for example, if somebody has made it through domestic violence, God forbid, they'd be a perfect psychologist to help others go through uh, domestic violence trauma. Somebody has made it through rape or sexual crimes and has healed themselves or at least balanced themselves they are truly seated to help they are truly suited to help others that are going through that same trauma other than that all we can do is listen to somebody pray for them meditate and send the peace that we feel in meditation towards them this verse goes much deeper than this uh, the second sentence says, it is not so with people in the world who see the sun without becoming the sun and see the sky and earth and everything else without becoming them. Adonai Ehad. Adonai Ehad. Part of our opening intonations or chanting. It means the Lord is one. The Lord is one with all of nature, with all of humanity. God, humanity, and nature are one. Adonai Ehad. So the problem is, is that humanity fragments itself from God, from nature. We're under this mistaken notion, this ignorance that we are separate. When we look at the sun, we don't become one with the sun. When we look at the sky, we don't become as expansive as the sky. When we look at the earth, we don't become as grounded as the earth. But we can. Whatever we look at, we should become one with it. Whenever you truly focused, if, if you were to focus on the sun, then you'd understand how the whole, co how the whole cosmos came into being. Yeah? And that's a spiritual fact. So whatever you focus on, you become spiritually. My spiritual master is a great woman who hugs people all around the world. And she offers spiritual advice. And she is the real deal. She is really one with God, truly illumined. And she said one time when interviewed, uh, Whenever I hug people, whenever I look at them, I become one with them. And that's how I know how to give advice to help them to alleviate their suffering. Because mystically, spiritually, she literally becomes them. My master knows that she's one with everything. She's attained full gnosis, to use the language of this church and this scripture. She maintains separation so she can act in the world, but she always knows in her consciousness that she's one with everything. In anything she focuses on, each person that comes to her, millions of people, over 40 million people she's hugged in her life. Each person, when she's looking at them, she becomes them. Imagine how you could help people if you can become one with them. This verse teaches that. On higher levels, in the realm of truth, you have seen things there and have become those things. You have seen the spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and have become spirit. You have seen Christ. You've really delved deep into Jesus, and you've become a Christ yourself, a Baranash, part of the Son of Mankind, collective Messiah. If you've seen the Father, you become the Father. These are very deep statements. Whatever you focus on one-pointedly with pure love and pure consciousness, you ultimately merge with that. Look at a leaf on a tree with pure love and pure consciousness without wavering, and you will enter that tree. This is not some new age mumbo jumbo. It's just a fact. It's just a fact that most humanity does not focus. And without focusing, you cannot really understand it. 
Without focusing it, you can't become one with it. Without focusing on God, you can never experience gnosis. So this is a challenge to us to really deeply pray daily, to deeply meditate, to focus on our scriptures. Whenever we serve others, why do we serve others? Why does James say in the letter of James that true worship that is undefiled before God is to serve the vulnerable? You serve the vulnerable, seeing them as the one body of Christ. All of humanity is one. If humanity is one, if there's one body and one blood, as all Christians hear in worship services, and many sects understand that differently, if everything is one, then we develop the attitude of seeing the people that are suffering around us in our neighborhoods as part of our own body, part of our own mystical body of humanity. And we reach out to somebody to alleviate their suffering with the same amount of intensity, care, and attention as though it were ourselves. When you have that intensity that you see a hungry person as an example, and you feel their hunger as your hunger, and you alleviate their hunger, seeing them as part of your one universal body, your expanded self, this takes you to the doorsteps of gnosis. Again, my spiritual master, especially in her earlier days, she would give her away her food to the homeless, and she was so in union with the person she was helping that her own stomach would feel full after she fed, after she fed the hungry. These are spiritual truths that we can attain by deeply examining this verse. Faith and love. Faith receives, love gives. No one can receive without faith, and no one can give without love. So to receive, we have faith, and to love, we give. If someone gives without love, that person gets no benefit from what was given. Anyone who receives something but does not receive the Lord is still a Hebrew. What does this mean? Let's break it down. So faith receives, love gives. If we truly have faith in God, in the teachings of Mar Yeshua, we invite that spiritual power, vibration, to fill us up. Faith is enuma, oh, pardon, emuna, pardon me, I always mix up the, the two consonants. Emuna is a Hebrew word that means to have fidelity with something. There's the famous verse. Uh, the season has come and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's how the phrase is often translated in English Bibles. Let's speak Hebrew Aramaic words. The time has come. The rulership of God is at hand. Submit to God and have fidelity with my proclamation. That is what Mar Yeshua said. So the time had come, Jesus saw it was spiritually time to begin teaching what he taught, which helps us to be rebirthed or spiritually regenerated into an anointed new humanity, the Baranash or son of mankind collective Messiah. The rulership of God is the Malkuth, and it's at hand. It's very close. It's very nearby because God's rulership is established within our heart. It is the inner guidance of heaven that is within our heart. Submit to God and have fidelity with, be faithful to my proclamation, my teachings. That's what Jesus really said in the Gospel of Mark. It's been greatly twisted. So faith receives. Whenever we do the spiritual teachings that Mar Yeshua suggests, we are exhibiting emuna, fidelity, faithfulness to the teachings. 
And when we have faithfulness at the teachings, we pray, we meditate, we study, we help the vulnerable, the basics of Mar Yeshua's teachings. And then we receive this vibration, we become dyed with God's infinite consciousness, infinite power, infinite wisdom, just like in the earlier verse that we had. And that dying can be seen by eyes that can see subtly, psychically even. So faith receives. If you do the spiritual works that Jesus taught, if you have faith and trust in God, then you receive a certain vibration, spiritual transformative vibration that changes us on very profound levels, matures us over time until we become sadiqs or perfected. Shalem, whole, tom, perfect. Love gives. Love gives. So if we're truly loving, we're giving something away. And it doesn't have to be money or resources. It could be a smile. It could be a kind word. It could be your time that you give somebody that needs you to listen to them. No one can receive. Nobody can have spiritual growth without faith. And no one can truly give without love. So to receive, we have faith, and to love, we give. If someone gives without love, that person gets no benefit from what was given. So there is spiritual merit and spiritual debt. Every time we do something good, that is spiritual merit that helps to purify our hearts and make us eligible for spiritual rebirth or uh, spiritual regeneration into the Baranash Collective Messiah. But a lot of people give with ulterior motives. We give so that somebody likes us. We give so that we come into a position of power. In other words, it's called sucking up, brown nosing, uh, doing something to get something. If you're really giving with love, you expect nothing in return, not a thank you, not love, not reciprocation of any kind. And this is the kind of giving that is very pure. But if you give out of desire, that is impure. And if you give to ultimately hurt somebody, that's dark giving. It's very evil. Some people do give things with evil intentions. So here, the Gospel of Philip is clarifying that if someone gives without love, without pure, unconditional love that expects nothing in return, that person gets no spiritual benefit from what was given. It does not mature their soul. It does not expand their consciousness. It does not perfect you. So you become part of the communion of saints, the son of mankind, collective Messiah. The last phrase is redacted and it's, it's garbage. You have to understand that over time, things were added to these gospels. The last line is anti-Semitic. Anyone who receives something but does not receive anyone who receives something but does not receive the Lord is still a Hebrew. So it's dividing anything divisive is not a true teaching that would extend back to Jesus. So anybody, anyone who receives something but does not receive the Lord is still a Hebrew, is still inferior. So it's saying uh, the Gnostics were very elite people, at least the first Gnostics. The first Gnostics were elite. They were more monastic and self-sacrificing, more aesthetic than Jesus's life-affirming pre-Kabbalistic teachings that were about life and living and everything else. The Gnostics' teachings in general were, were escaping the world, or they became developed into the idea of escaping the world, going beyond this world, which is like a cage for the soul, and going beyond creation to be with the invisible father and the higher Pleroma realms. Mar Yeshua, when you understand his probable historical teachings, he wanted to purify this earth. He didn't want to run away from it. He wanted to make humanity better. He wanted to make the earth better. He wanted to expand consciousness and pure love in this planet. That was his goal. 
He didn't want to run away. He wanted to dig in deep. And he definitely would not differentiate between Christians and Hebrew because there was no Christian in Hebrew. Everybody were Israelites. Everybody was Hebrew. Everybody were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. But ultimately at this time, the, the separation between the hero of the Gnostics was Paul, especially the Valentinians. A lot of the Valentinian Gnosis was inspired by Paul. And uh, Valentinus claimed to be a disciple of Thutis. And Valentinus claimed that Thutis was a disciple of Paul. So they, they claim a direct lineage back to Paul. And Paul was the one that created Christianity. James the Just of the Jerusalem Assembly, the so-called Jewish Christians, James identified as a Jew and he thought that in order to follow Jesus, you had to become a Jew, become circumcised and follow the different and follow Torah and the different holy days of the Jewish calendar, which is historically true. But Paul developed a bunch of mystical revelations. And that's really where, and not all of them, I'm not, I'm not dissing Paul. A lot of what Paul teaches is very good. And people need to understand what is probably historical in Paul and what is not. I wrote my master's thesis on the dissecting Paul's authentic letters and understanding what was historical and what was made up or received through his mystical visions. And there's a lot of value in what was not made up. So that's why we get a lot of things that are different. When Paul said, here's Christianity, we must follow Paul. Eventually that created a permanent rift between what would become Christianity and Judaism. And Gnosticism was quite a bit down the road. The scripture isn't, you know, from like the 120 AD to 200 AD, probably later. I can check on that for you and get back and write it in the YouTube details when this was probably developed. But this was much later than Jesus, much later than Paul. And this was at a time whenever a lot of anti-Semitic stuff was coming up in the canonical gospels. And then from there, this became even more anti-Semitic because a lot of Gnostics believed that the Hebrew God was the Demiurge, the one that created the world a prison and created the prisons of our bodies. So the Jewish God was a lesser God. And the invisible father was the father of Jesus, the Christian God or the Gnostic Christian God, as they came to understand. So here they're definitely giving an anti-Semitic thought that would not be rooted in anything Jesus taught. However, everything before this last sentence is very rooted in the probable historical teachings of Jesus. It was probably handed down authentically through tradition. So we should always think when we wake up in the morning, when we have our cup of coffee or whatever it is that we do to wake up, a cup of tea, uh, whatever, what good shall I do this day? What can I do purely for the person across the street, for my family members, for my workmate? What can I do with a pure heart without expecting anything in return that will somehow benefit and uplift one or more people today? That is the goal. That is the spiritual practice. That is embodying the teachings of Jesus and making them real. And when we do that with fidelity, we receive spiritual vibration from God, from Mar Yeshua that transforms us on a cellular level, on an astral level, and on a causal level that leads us into oneness with the divine all, the Abba, the Father, Mother, God. And may this be so for all of us. Let's continue with the Liturgy of the Chalice.